ברוכות הבאות, ladies, and welcome to another edition of our Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to our incredible Torah site for women, ohelsara.com, or to the global, incredible, amazing site, Torah Anytime, or if you're a YouTube subscriber, thank you so very much for tuning in every single time we post a lecture. I am so proud of your spiritual endeavors. May Hashem continue to bless your spiritual journey, bless you with much clarity and fortitude, and give you the strength to continue to want to learn His Torah and to yearn for it. Thank you so very much for your dedication. Hashem should bless you. I want to thank every single person donor who has been donating whether it's monthly donors who have been supporting us you don't have to you have to understand your monthly support keeps us maintained here in the holy land what a schut what a merit you have for all those who have been sponsoring torah hours so i should be able to continue to learn benachat which means with with how do you explain a nachat really with with pleasure and with com- a comfortable feeling and to continue to design and create and produce for you what I hope is inspirational ma- spiritual material for you. Thank you so very much to all those who are helping needy families here in Eretz Yisrael and even abroad. Thank you so very much. Thank you to all of those who have been helping my rabbi in Natanya, Rav Moshe ben Moshe, sheizkele yamim tovim varukim, you should live and be well. have a healthy life and a prosperous life. Hashem should continue to give him tremendous physical strength and spiritual strength. Thank you to all of those who have been trying to support our local mikvah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And more than anything, thank you for all of those who have taken the time to donate to me personally. Um, I saw recently that Some of you have donated to our new campaign, which is to help maintain us here. And I just have to say, I get very emotional every single time I see another dedication, another heartwarming message, another donation that helps to sponsor our cause, at least on a personal level here in Eretz Yisrael. And therefore, I want to make special mention of my Dear, dear student, Melissa Spruel, who recently made a generous donation, and I want to read you her dedication because it was so special. She wrote, for Rabbanit Cohen, may Hashem bless you with happiness, with sustenance, safety, guidance, and daily connection to the blessed one, which is Hashem, obviously. Thank you for everything, she writes. Happy Mother's Day to my spiritual Ima. Isn't that beautiful? Today, I guess, is Mother's Day. <laughs> so I, I uh, want to thank Melissa and her husband. Thank you so very much. And uh, I hope the babies, the twins are doing well. Shem should continue to give them health and sustenance. Also, special mention, Romero, Romeo Rodriguez sponsored generously in honor of his firstborn granddaughter's 17th birthday on May 13th, which is tomorrow, Sophia Isabel. So thank you so much, Romeo, and may your granddaughter have tremendous success and blessings from above in everything that she does. And also a special mention, Joshua Murdoch, who recently made such a generous donation in honor of the health and spiritual guidance of his new bride, Mia Ray Murdoch. They just got married about a week ago, a little more than a week ago. Hashem should bless that union. Hashem should give them both, this new couple, tremendous strength, sustenance, fortitude, a happy marriage, shalom bayit, harmony in the home, and Hashem should guide them towards his path. Thank you so much, Joshua and Mia. I want to thank all those who have been making donations, but without, I don't have an email address for you. So either you've been sending in checks to our Brooklyn address, or you've been making uh, payments through PayPal, but I don't have your email for some reason. Thank you to Yelena Grinman, to Jeanette Stevens from Bellingham, Washington, to Gabriella Hart and Nava Bailey from 
I hope I'm saying this right from Waiane, Hawaii. And thank you to Rosa Moreno. Please, please answer Amen to the following. For the Refua Shlema, donations were made for the Refua Shlema of Dalia Bat Alice, 65 year old lady. As you know, we've been davening for her, we've been praying for her, who has progressing stages of cancer. Hashem should keep her well. She should have a long life to be able to see the Mashiach with her own eyes. The, for the Fua Shlema, for the speedy recovery of Yaakov Ishai Ben Naami, for the speedy recovery of Yohanna Wankmiller, for the Fua Shlema of Shana Rachel Bat Sarah. Please answer Amen to the Ilui Neshama, the elevation of the soul of Miral Bat Tzvi Halevi, for the Ilui Alea Shalom. For the Ilui Neshama of Ratsa Bat Menachem Akoen, Alea Shalom. For the Ilui Neshama of Tzvi Ben Chona Ruvain Halevi, Alava Shalom. For the Ilui Neshama of John, Jack, Edward, Pring, Zichono Levracha. I forgot to mention also, I'm sorry, we're going to go back to Refua Shlema of Yecheskel Ben Rivka Miral. Shem should send him a speedy recovery. Please answer Amen. We want a special success and protection for all the soldiers who are right now entering Rafa, some who have already entered. Unfortunately, we have had a number of deaths in the last few days. All those soldiers who were taken from this world before their time, the 19-year-olds, the 20-year-olds, the 21-year-olds, all those who are terribly injured, Hashem should, first of all, watch over every single precious neshama that's out there trying to save the Jewish people, not just here, but by saving us here, they're saving the world. Hashem should continue to send them malachim, angels, to protect them and defend them out there. And for those who have unfortunately passed on, Hashem should give them an aliyat neshama, an elevation of the soul. And we should daven that they above pray for us here, Shem should give tremendous support and comfort to their families. And also, of course, for the protection, uh, special protection of all those hostages who are still in Gaza, we hope and we pray that Hashem is keeping them safe and that they should come home unharmed and return to us very, very, very soon. Please answer Amen for the Zivug Hagun, for the soulmates. You should, they should be Zaycha Merit to their soulmate this year of Sarah Miriam Bat Chava and Galit Yam Bat Gavriela. Please let us know that Hashem sent you, your soulmate. I want to see a wedding invitation. I want to see that you're getting married this year. You should walk down to your chuppah Be'ezat Hashem. I want to thank all those who have been donating for Torah hours. Thank you to Perry Brown, who's sponsoring Torah Hours on a monthly basis, as well as Malki Katz. Thank you so very much. Thank you to Anita Hug, to Gay Marie Allison and Jonas Haley, 300 hours of Torah. Thank you, Dixie K. Pring, 300 hours of Torah. Thank you, Shelly Abadi, 300 hours of Torah. Pearl Weinberger sponsored 300 hours of Torah for the honor of the IDF soldiers that Hashem should circle them and in, 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 encircle them with his shield and the Malachim should protect them always. Thank you to Vina Nair who sponsored 700 hours of Torah. And thank you to Kathy Fujioki, Fujioka from Hawaii sponsored 700 hours of Torah. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Hashem should bless you. And in the merit of those hours, Hashem should fortify your life and keep you safe and guarded. This week's Shiu is being sponsored by David Burgess, in the honor of, for the honor of Anna Dimitriou, I hope I said that correctly, who was an inspiringly righteous woman. Thank you so much, David, Mr. Burgess, for, for supporting us, for sponsoring this lecture, which I hope will inspire everyone. May Hashem bless your spiritual efforts, give you whatever you need, and even some of what you want. This lecture has also been partially sponsored by Norma Diaz. 
I thank all those who have made it a point and made an effort to really, really, really help our amazing organization, Ohel Sara. Let's begin because we have a lot of work to do today. This week's parasha, Parashat Emor, discusses the various Chagim, the various holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shavuot, Pesach, etc. All the holidays are written in this week's parasha. And concerning the Chagim and certain time periods, the Holy Meiri, Allah Shalom, quotes a pasuk, a verse from Sefer Teilim, that states, Et la'asot la'ashem, there is a time to do for Hashem. Heferu Torah they have made your Torah void. What does this mean? The Gemara explains that there are certain times when the Jewish people, certain times in history, when the Jewish people are in spiritual or phys physical danger, and the Rabbanim must make the difficult decision of temporarily suspending the Torah, a specific Torah law, and they do so in order to do something drastic to save the Jewish people in the future. That means that they temporarily break the law because there's a national need for it. An example of this is the story of Purim. Esther Malka, Aleh Shalom, and Mordechai, Aleh Shalom, proclaimed a three-day fast because the Jewish people were in danger of extermination. But when did that fast take place? The fast, one of the days of the fast, was on the first day of Pesach. Now, normally, we don't fast on Pesach because we have to fulfill all the mitzvot, all the commandments that accompany the Seder night, which include eating and drinking. But Esther and Mordechai concluded that if we don't fast on that given Pesach all those years ago, there will be no more Pesachs to commemorate because Haman might just succeed in annihilating us. Chaz v'shalom, God forbid. So it was better to halt one Pesach in order to celebrate many more in the future. Et la asot la Hashem. When there's a time period for Hashem where we want to preserve the kedusha when we want to safeguard the holiness of the Torah, we're allowed to suspend the Torah temporarily. Now, let me warn you, please do not try this at home. This is not for us to decide in this generation. This is something that very holy rabbis must decide if and when it is necessary. But the point is that the Me'iri, Allah Shalom, further explains that Yahadut, Judaism, is made up of various seasons and times. We have the period of Pesach, which takes place in the spring. There's the time of Shavuot, which is in the summertime. We have the holiday of Sukkot, which occurs in the fall. Every Chag comes with its specific mitzvot and customs and season, and we're always advancing from one season to the next. As soon as one Chag is over, we're already thinking of the next Chag and what we have to do in order to prepare for it. And sadly, many of us have become like robots, slaves to that particular season, in the sense that, for example, when Pesach rolls around, uh, we say, oh, Pesach? Oh, that's a holiday where we have to eat matzah. Sukkot, that's the holiday I have to build a sukkah. Hanukkah, that's the holiday where I have to light a menorah. We become like robots where we don't consider the essence and the significance behind the mitzvot. Yeah, we, the, the Hanukkah is the time that we have to light a menorah. But why do we light candles on Hanukkah? Yes, Pesach is the time that we have to eat matzot, but why are we eating matzot on Pesach? So instead, we're kind of focused on preparing for the holiday without knowing much about the holiday or its essence. 
So we end up doing things in a very mechanical and rote fashion. The Me'iri actually compares this, sadly, to a donkey. How? He says, sometimes the chamor, the donkey, carries wheat on its back, and sometimes he carries grapes. What is that going to depend on? It depends on the season. But the donkey doesn't know what he's doing. Whatever they put on his back, that's what he's going to schlep, says the Me'iri. Sometimes we go through the months of the year without real contemplation. We're like robots that are bound by the season or the clock. When the clock hits 6.50 p.m. in the summertime, we run to light candles on Friday night. But we may not stop to think about the depth behind lighting those candles. So the Me'iri therefore concludes that a religion that's practiced in such an ordinary and rote fashion develops the danger of extinction. Chaz v'shalom, God forbid. Et la sot la Hashem. If Judaism, says the Mi'iri, is only based on a seasonal period, on an et la asot, but there's no real contemplation behind why we do what we do, then the result will be heferu toratecha. Such a Torah can one day become nullified. God forbid. That means that ultimately, Hashem is not interested only in the ceremonial rituals. Hashem wants us to consider the mitzvot and to think about them very deeply. He wants us to understand their purpose. He doesn't want this religion to turn into something bland and unexciting. Well, we are now in one of those seasons. It's the season of Sfirat HaOmer. This season is very significant. But when we hear the words, Sfirat HaOmer, we immediately think of the rituals, that we can't listen to music during this time period, we can't cut our hair or buy new clothing, we can't make weddings, go to live shows. Many people are already looking at the calendar to see when HaOmer ends so they could schedule their vacations and move on with life. So unfortunately, Naomer becomes another season of the year that's merely filled with rules and regulations, but we don't bother to contemplate why these rituals were even put into place. So today, Be'ezat Hashem, with Hashem's help, I am going to try to create an excitement in your heart to stir your neshamot, to move your souls so that you appreciate the greatness of our Torah and of Judaism. Many years ago, there was a great rabbi named Rabbi Akiva, alama shalom. We all know who he was and what he accomplished. But to refresh your memory, let's take a few minutes to recap his story. Rabbi Akiva was a great Tana, a great and holy Torah scholar who had 24,000 students, and his students were not regular people. They were on a very high level of spirituality. Sadly, they all perished within the first 33 days of the Omer. That's unimaginable. Chachamim teach us that such a tragedy is worse than the Churban Bet HaMikdash. That's worse than the destruction of the Holy Temple. This was such a national tragedy. And the Rabbanim don't want us to forget this national catastrophe. We can't just ignore the fact that 24,000 righteous scholars, righteous sages died. We have to do something to commemorate this terrible tragedy. So the least we could do is not listen to music for a few, a few weeks. The least we could do is not buy new clothing or, or make weddings. The least we could do is mourn for them. These Talmidim are worth a little bit of discomfort. But there must be something more to this than just the fact that these students perished, because this wasn't the first time in Am Yisrael that we suffered such a tragic loss. I mean, if we'd commemorate all the national tragedies of our people, We'd never be able to listen to music, take haircuts, or get married. 
After all, how much suffering has this nation endured? And we're still going through it right now as we speak. The Gentile world, think about our history, has burned our Sifrei Torah. They destroyed our communities and they killed tens of thousands of our people. And also thousands of our Chachamim throughout our history. So why then is this particular time period of Sirat Omer marked as one of national mourning? Why do we have to mourn now during Sfirat Omer and not any other time for any other tragedy? What makes the tragedy of Rabbi Akiva's students so much greater than any other calamity in the history of our people? So I'd like to explain a fundamental concept that I think you all should know. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah and its laws, he also provided us with understanding. Now, the Torah is not synthetic. It's not made in China. The Torah is a Kadosh Baruch Hu's divine wisdom. But together with the Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a tremendous power. He gave us the ability to create something that's called Chidushim on his Torah. He gave us the ability to take the Torah and to uncover new ideas, interesting revelations. And not just that we're able to develop new ideas, but we're, de we're developing concepts that no ear has ever heard before. That's what we call a chidush, a revelation, something that's new from the word hadash. And where are these chidushim produced? Generally, they're produced in the yeshivot, in the houses of study. A yeshiva is not a place that, you know, makes toys or cosmetics. The talmidim, the students who are sitting and learning in the yeshiva are producing Torah. You know what it means to produce Torah? The Torah that they're creating is a new kind of Torah with new questions, new answers, and new concepts within the framework of an existing Torah. En midrash belo chidush. When the Rabbanim learn in the Bet Midrash, in the study halls, something new is always being discovered and produced. Every Jew who has the zechut, who has the merit to learn Torah, has to know that Hashem gave him the ability to be a mechadesh Torah, to promote new concepts in Torah, to expand on the words of Torah and bring more light to the world. That's why I'm so happy every time I, I am informed and notified that someone has sponsored Torah Hours because you are part of that revelation. So thank you so much again for sponsoring Torah Hours. Now, we know that Hashem and his Torah are eternal. And after 120 years, when we're Zaycha, when we're going to merit to enter into Gan Eden, many of us are going to be hearing the sounds of the most incredible revelations of Torah. You know, some people think that going to heaven means that somebody up there is going to prepare you a hammock to rest on, and that you're going to be served pina coladas while eating grapes and drinking wine. But that's not what's going to happen in Shamaim. We are going to be learning chidushim that our ears have never heard while we were living here on earth. It's actually going to be one of the most thrilling parts of being in Shamaim. Think of it this way. In this world, Material pleasures always come to an end. I mean, how many steaks can you eat before you experience a stomach ache? How many dresses can you wear at the same time? The physical world comes with limitations. But in the area of ruchaniyut, of spirituality, you can experience a world that's unlimited. The Torah is filled with chidushim upon chidushim that we merit to uncover. It's an infinite world of revelations. 
And that's the reason for the tragedy of Rabbi Akiva's Talmidim. Do you know how much Torah, how many revelations, how many Chidushim, those 24,000 Talmidim were able to produce during their lifetime? But when they perished from this world, all that Torah unfortunately expired along with them because they'd no longer be able to produce novel ideas for the world to draw inspiration from. So do you know how much light was removed from this world? Do you understand what kind of loss this was? Abi Akiva was the only survivor from his entire yeshiva. He had to begin reteaching his Torah to a handful of students. So he went from having one of the largest yeshivot in the world to having a small class of five students. And if it wasn't for those five Talmidim, we would not have the oral law. We would not have the Talmud because most of the Gemara that's learned today is due to those five Talmidim. All the major works of the Torah Shel Be'al Peh of the oral law came from Rabbi Akiva's five Talmidim. Could you imagine that? So look at how vast the Talmud is, and that's just from five students. Could you imagine what the Talmud would have looked like if these 24,000 students would have lived? Could you imagine what kind of Torah and revelations would have been produced? So during this time, Asfirat Omer, we're not only mourning the physical loss of the 24,000 Talmidim, we are also mourning the amount of Torah that was lost as well. Churban HaTorah, the destruction, is something to cry about. It's a national tragedy when we lose Torah. And I'll explain to you why. There's a bracha that we recite every morning. We say, Baruch Ata Hashem, blessed are you, Hashem, God, Asher Natan Lanu et Torato, who gave us his Torah, etc., etc., etc. Baruch Ata Hashem, blessed are you, God, Noten Ha Torah, he who gives the Torah. The famous Taz, Allah Shalom, asks a question. This blessing begins with the words, Asher Natan Lanu et Torato, who gave us his Torah. In the past, on Al Sinai, he gave. But then we end the blessing by saying, Baruch Ata Hashem, blessed are you Hashem, Notan HaTorah, he who gives the Torah. Gives is in the present tense. So what's going on over here? Was the Torah given to us in the past? Or is it being given to us right now in the present? Asher Natan is the past. Noten HaTorah is in the present. So which is it? past or present? The answer is, there are two Torahs. There's a Torah of the past that Hashem indeed gave us on Har Sinai. But then every single day, Hashem transmits to our Chachamim a new Torah. God reveals new ideas, new concepts, new chidushim, new revelations that leave us in, in, inspired and thirsting for, for more. So there's an original Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu natan lanu. He gave to us. That's the starting point. So the Torah is like the clay, so to speak. But the Chachamim, our rabbis are called bonaich. They are called the builders. What are they building exactly? They're not wearing construction hats on their heads. You know what they're building? They are building on the Torah. They're creating Torah. Hashem gives them the ability to find divine revelations hidden in the words of the Torah that was given to us at Har Sinai, and they're doing it at present. That means that our Torah is not an ancient book that's prehistoric that should be locked away in the archives of history. Our Torah is constantly revitalizing itself by virtue of our Chachamim. 
נותן התורה means that every single day הקדוש ברוך הוא allows these novel חידושים of תורה to come down from שמיים and flow into the Bet Midrash, into the study halls where they're being discovered, these revelations, by our current Talmidim, by our current, current students. That's the greatness and depth of Torah. The Goim, they're also producing new material for people to learn. The difference is that most of what they're teaching is a falsehood. You see, to come up with a, a new idea, that's not a novelty. But to promote and discover the truth, that's already a higher level. So every day, Hashem is transmitting that truth to our Rabbanim. Every day, it's as though Hashem is recreating Matan Torah. And if you'd ask, well, when was the Torah given? The answer would be, the Torah is being given over to you right now in this very moment. Chidushim, revelations are being produced and transmitted as we speak. That's the idea of noten ha-Torah, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is currently giving you the Torah. So now that you have a basic idea of what a chidush really means and its significance in the world, I want to explain to you a very interesting Gemara. When Moshe Rabbeinu, alav shalom, went up to Shamaim to bring the Torah down to this world, he realized that it was not going to be an easy task. The Malachim, the angels, were not happy about the idea of a mortal man being in Shamaim. I mean, they protested. They said to Hashem, What is this mortal being, being that was born of a woman doing among us here in the heavens? He doesn't even belong here. And they were further infuriated when Hashem informed them that Moshe was there to take the Torah down to the earth. The angels were angry. What? Such a precious treasure cannot be given to the human beings who are going to trample upon it. At that moment, Hashem turned to Moshe Rabbeinu when he said, give them an answer because the truth is they have a valid claim. And Moshe said, how can I answer them? I'm afraid they're going to burn me with their fire. The fire that's going to come out of their mouths. And Hashem said, don't worry, Moshe. Hold on to my throne of glory, and you'll be protected. So Moshe Rabbeinu turned to the angels and he asked them, what's written in the Torah? Does it not say, Kabed et avicha ve'et imecha? Honor your father and your mother? Do any of you angels have mothers? Do you have parents? No. The Torah also states, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Are any of you married? Do any of you know what jealousy means? The Torah also states, you shall not steal. Do any of you engage in thievery or, or, or in losses of financial matters? You have no connection to this Torah. It doesn't belong to you. After Moshe's, Moshe's argument, the angels, the Malachim, were convinced and they conceded and they agreed to allow Moshe Rabbeinu to bring the Torah down to this world. This Gemara needs an explanation. So let's understand the depth behind this episode. Chachamim explain that the angels want to be the teachers of Torah. They said, let us go down to the earth and let us be the ones to teach the Torah to the Jewish people, to Am Yisrael. We want to be in charge of the Torah education department. If you think about it, I mean, imagine a malach, an angel walking into a high school class to teach you homash. Wouldn't that be amazing? I'd love that. So Moshe told the Malachim, it's very nice that you want to lead the education of Torah, but let me ask you this. 
the Torah commands us to honor our parents. You don't have physical parents. So how in the world do you plan to teach something that you don't practice? If the teacher does not practice what he's teaching, the students will never listen. The entire limud, the entire study will turn into one big joke. So Moshe Rabbeinu told the Malachim, you can't possibly be the teachers of Am Yisrael. You, you, you could be wonderful teachers, of course, but you won't have much of an effect on the student. If you don't practice what you preach, if you don't know what it means to go through challenges or what it's like to come face to face with the yetzer hara, with the evil inclination, how can you teach us about combating the evil in the world? Your teachings are going to fall on deaf ears. When the angels heard this, they realized that Moshe Rabbeinu was right. Only someone who follows the Torah according to God's standards can teach the Torah. Now we're all familiar with the famous Gemara concerning the baby in its mother's womb. A malach, an angel, teaches every baby the entire Torah while in its mother's womb. But right before the baby is born to the world, the angel taps the baby on the upper lip. That's why we have this indentation underneath our nose. And boom, the baby forgets all the Torah that he learned. And the reason the baby forgets is because a Torah that's taught by a teacher who doesn't practice the Torah can eventually be forgotten. But a Torah that's learned from a human being who lives the Torah and struggles with the yetzel, struggles with the inclination in the same way you do, such a Torah is truly valuable. Such a Torah can be upheld. That's one explanation. But today, I'm going to offer you a chidush, a new revelation. As a side note, by the way, concerning chidushei Torah, did you ever wonder where the power of the revelations of Torah come from? Chachamim tell us that the power lies in a human being who's constantly mechadesh himself. It lies in the power of a human being who is constantly renewing himself. That means that every time the yetzer hara, the evil inclination, challenge you, challenges you, you're faced with the question of what? Should I? Shouldn't I? Can I? Can't I? And when you overcome the challenge, you become a different person. At no moment in life are you ever the same. Human beings are always being mechadesh themselves. Every time you defeat the yetzerara in your difficult battle against him, you become a new person with an elevated purpose. So the human being is the biggest chidush out there. You are the greatest revelation. Therefore, only human beings are given that gift of creating chidushei Torah because we are constantly changing ourselves. A human, be a human being has the ability to overcome the evil inclination, to do mitzvot, and to rise one step above himself. That human being is constantly renewing himself and he's constantly growing. Therefore, a person who is changing and renewing himself is given the ability to create revelations of Torah. But an angel doesn't grow. He's stagnant. At whatever level the angel was created, that's where he remains. He can't become a better angel. The malachim are holy. They're very holy. But they're not moving or rising to any levels. They are who they are. Human beings are different. We are always aspiring to reach another level higher than the one before. We are always being mechadesh ourselves, always renewing ourselves. And therefore, we're the ones 
who can create novelties in Torah. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu was telling the Malachim. He said to them, if you want the Torah to remain in the heavens and to be the teachers of Am Yisrael, you most certainly have that option. But you should know that if you're going to do that, there will never be a chidush Torah. There will never be a revelation of Torah created in the world and the Torah will remain the same Torah forever. There will be no novel ideas introduced to the world that can help the human beings rise in their levels of spirituality. When you grow spiritually, the Torah can grow with you. When you're mechadesh yourselves, when you're renewing yourselves, you can discover revelations on Torah that will inspire you to elevate, uh, to elevate yourself even higher. That was Moshe Rabbeinu's argument to the Malachim, to the angels. And that's why David HaMelech, Alav HaShalom, in Sefer Tehilim says the following concerning Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, Ali Talamarom, Moshe, you ascended on high, you went up to the heavens, Shavita Shevi, and you took captives. You released the Torah that was in captivity in the hands of the angels. Let's understand these words on a deeper level. And for that, I have to divert a little bit from this Shi'ul and introduce you to a completely different story. And when I'm done with that story, I'm going to come back to this verse, to this pasuk, and then it's all going to make sense to you. The Gemara tells us of a particular meeting that took place between three great Tanaim during the Roman occupation in Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eli, alav shalom, Rabbi Yossi, alav shalom, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, alav shalom. They were once discussing the Romans. And it was that conversation and the aftermath of Rabbi Shimon's comments about the Romans that caused him and his son Rabbi Elazar, Allah Shalom, to run away and hide in a cave for many years. In that cave, Rabbi Shimon merited to uncover the greatest secrets of the universe and of the Torah. It was in that cave that he wrote the famous Zohar HaKadosh, the mystical secrets of Torah that was taught to him by Eliyahu Navi Zachor Latov. Now, as Jews, we believe that there are no coincidences in the world. So there must have been a reason why these three specific sages, these three specific Tanaim met on that day to discuss the Romans, which in turn caused Rabbi Shimon to flee for his life and hide in a cave for all those years. So what's the real story behind this mysterious meeting? The Chidushe Arim, Alav Shalom, reveals something wondrous concerning the heavenly connection between these three tzaddikim, these three righteous sages. He says that we know from the Midrash that the Asara Harugei Malchut, the ten martyrs, were the Gilgulim, were the reincarnations of the ten Shvatim, of the ten tribes who sinned concerning the selling of, the, of their brother Yosef HaTzadik, Alav HaShalom. Yosef was sold by his brothers to a band of Ishmaelim, and then later on resold to Potiphar in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. So these 10 Shvatim, who played a role in the selling of their brother Yosef, had to come down in a Gilgul, in a reincarnation, in order to correct that sin. And it was decreed that they die a horrible death in the next carnation, incarnation. Hence, the Asara Harugei Malchut, the horrible death of the ten martyrs who are righteous sages. Interesting, interestingly, says the Chidushe Harim, 
the three Tanaim, the three sages that met on that fateful day, their names were Yehuda, Yossi, also known as Yosef, and Shimon. These three Tanaim were a Gilgul of the three main Shvatim, of the three main tribes who were involved in Mechirat Yosef, in the selling of Yosef. Yehuda, Yosef HaTzadik himself, and Shimon. They were the prime figures in the story. So these three Tanaim who carried within them the Neshamot, the souls of those three tribes, came down to this world in order to correct the Pgam, the blemish of Mechirat Yosef, of the selling of Yosef that they were all a part of. How did they partake in the selling of Yosef? Well, the Torah tells us that Yehuda was the one who suggested to the brothers that they sell Yosef rather than kill him. So Yehuda was directly responsible for the selling of Yosef. That's Yehuda. Concerning Shimon, he was the one who initially wanted to kill Yosef, but Reuven, the oldest of the tribes, suggested that they throw him into the pit instead. But had it not been for Reuven, Shimon may have succeeded in his plan. So Shimon also had a part in the selling of Yosef. But what about Yosef HaTzadik? What role did he play in his own selling? Our rabbis tell us that Yosef played a small part in his own selling because he incited the hatred of the brothers towards him. When he spoke Lashonara about them to their father, when he spoke uh, not nicely of them to their father, um, and therefore, he also needed a tikkun. He also needed a rectification for the part that he played in being sold to Mitzrayim, into Egypt. So these three Tanaim, who were the Gilgulim of those three tribes, gathered together on that day because it was decreed from Shamaim, from heaven, that the tikkun, that the rectification for the selling of Yosef now had to be made. Today, I'm going to focus on the tikkun of the rectification of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who we're told was the Gilgul of Shimon ben Yaakov. The Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah tells us that when Potiphar sent Yosef to prison after falsely accusing him of violating his wife, Yosef remained in this dark dungeon for 12 years. For 12 years, he didn't see the light of day or receive visitors. He was isolated and alone, removed from the world and from real life. Says the Chidushe Harim, in order to atone for the painful affliction Yosef had to experience those 12 years, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Gilgul, the reincarnation of Shimon ben Yaakov, had to hide in a dark cave and be secluded for 12 years, isolated from the world and his family in the same way Yosef HaTzadik suffered. Not only that, but the Yari Kadosh Alav Shalom states that in reality, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was supposed to be among the Asara Rugei Malchut. He was supposed to be one of the 10 martyrs who die a horrible death like his Rebbe, like Rabbi Akiva, Lava Shalom. But somehow he managed to sweeten the harsh judgment against him, to be mamtik the din, and he found a way to abolish the decree without having to die. How did he do it? He did it by introducing the secrets of Torah to a dark world filled with the ideologies of the Romans. He brought a lot of light into this dark world. And by doing so, he was able to annul the decree against him. For all those 
who support the Torah, for all those out there who keep funding, donating, and supporting the Torah, do you understand the power and the magnitude of what you do? Anyway, unfortunately, even though Abishimon was able to divert his own death, Hashem still required a tenth man to fill his place. And somebody else had to die instead of him. The question is, if Rabbi Shimon was a Gilgul of Shimon ben Yaakov, who partook in the selling of Yosef, and he had to be punished in this manner by being secluded in a cave for 12 years, how did he merit to be the one to introduce us to the Zohar HaKadosh? There, there must be a connection between the fact that Rabbi Shimon sat in this cave for 12 years as a kapara, as an atonement for the selling of Yosef, and the fact that he merited specifically during those 12 years to discover the Torah Tanistar, to discover the hidden and mystical side of the Torah. There's got to be a connection. So let's see what we discover as we proceed. In Parashat Kedoshim, the Pasuk states, Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe Lemor. And God spoke to Moshe, saying, Daber el Kol Adad Bene Israel. Speak to the entire congregation of the children of Israel. Veamarta Alehem. And say to them, Kedoshim Tehiu. You shall be holy. Ki Kadosh Ani Hashem Elokechem. For I, Hashem, your God, am holy. Ashi Kadosh Alav Shalom explains that the words Kedoshim Tihiyu means that Am Yisrael have to be Perushim. They have to remain separated from all forms of immorality and erva. In order for us to rise to levels of spirituality and to discover realms of Torah that are beyond this world, we must be Kedoshim. We must separate ourselves from all kinds of immorality. Rashi actually says, Shekol makom geder erva. Wherever you're going to see a fence that's put up in order to avoid immorality, he says, there is where you're going to find holiness. Now, we all know the story of Shimon and Levi, who were Kanaim La Hashem. They were zealots who killed out the entire city of Shechem because of the Chilul Hashem, because of the desecration of God's name that Shechem ben Hamor did with Dina, their sister. Shechem broke that fence of modesty and he violated a young maiden, Dina. He engaged in an immoral act of arayot, of sexual decadence. He stripped a young woman of her virtue. Shimon and Levi were so horrified by this act that they came to their father and they, and they said, Ha-chezunaya et achotenu? Are we going to allow this vulgar man, Shechem, to turn our sister into a harlot? Now, since Shimon was older than Levi, he became the leader who fought for the cause of Tzniyot. He's the one who fought to uphold modesty. He was the one who built fences against immoral behavior so that holiness would be maintained among the Jewish people. And as a result of that, he was the one to become the foundation by which a path was paved to reach high levels of spirituality. He paved a path for us to be able to discover the secrets of Torah, because such a Torah cannot be discovered if there is no Kedusha, if there is no holiness in the encampment of Am Yisrael. Therefore, says the Chidushe Arim, even though Shimon ben Yaakov, 
Shimon, the son of Yaakov, played a part in the selling of Yosef, something extraordinary resulted from that terrible mistake. What was the extraordinary event? The Midrash states, Yosef Yarad la Mitzrayim. Yosef went down to Egypt as a result of his brothers selling him. Vegider atzmo min ha'erva. And there in Egypt, he created spiritual barriers around his soul in order to protect himself from any form of immorality. And as a result of that, in the merit of Yosef, when Am Yisrael had to go down to Egypt and they became slaves there, they too were able to maintain those barriers. Amar Bichia Bar Abba said, Rabbi Chia, the son of Abba. It was worth it for Yosef, for Yosef to have been sold just so he could build those fences against immorality in Egypt. So that he could enable the Jewish people, Israel, to survive the impure society of Egypt and to finally be redeemed from there. You hear this? So in the merit of Shimon and Levi's zealotry, in that they wiped out Shechem and they did away with that kind of immorality, they merited it to what the Gemara of Shabbat states. Megalgalin schut al zakai. A merit comes back to he who is meritorious. The Gemara explains that what this means is that Yosef ended up in Egypt and maintained his holiness amid all that tumah, all that spiritual immorality, and he was able to pave the way for Am Yisrael so that they'd be able to preserve their holiness in Egypt. And it was in that merit that Am Yisrael were redeemed from Egypt and merited to receive the Torah on Har Sinai. We merit it to be the recipients of God's holy Torah, the Torah whose deep wisdom can only be understood on a heavenly level when we are truly kedoshim, when we're truly holy. We can now understand why Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai merited to the revelation of the secrets of Torah specifically during those 12 years of seclusion in the cave. He was there all those years in order to correct what he did in the previous Gilgul as Shimon ben Yaakov, that he sold his brother Yosef and that Yosef had to live in a dungeon for 12 years. But, says the Chidush Arim. Even though it's true that a rectification was needed for such an act against a fellow brother, as a result of the selling of Yosef, Yosef was able to pave a path of holiness for all of us. He was able to fill the air of Egypt with the spiritual gene of Kedusha so that we'd be able to survive that exile, that galut, and merit to receive the Torah and understand its wisdom on the highest of levels. Therefore, since Rabbi Shimon was the Gilgul of Shimon ben Yaakov, who was the founder of this spiritual fence that protected us, he merited in that cave to reach exalted levels of spirituality and to introduce us to a world of chidushim, of revelations that are extensions of the Torah that we received on Har Sinai. So perhaps now we can understand the phrase in the famous hymn that we sing about, about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. What do we say? Bar Yochai, ne'ezarta b'gvura. Son of Yochai, you girded yourself with strength. 
and you attained total self-mastery in order to fight the battle of the Torah of black fire and white. And you unsheathed your sword, shalafta negetzorerecha, and brandished it against the enemies of your people. Now this is very strange, because where do we see anywhere in the Gemara or the Midrashim, or even in the Zohar Kadosh that Rabbi Shimon fought a battle for the sake of Torah, which is called Eshdat, and where do we see that he even carried a sword and unsheathed it in order to fight the enemies? The Chidoshe Arim explains that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai saw the following through Ruach HaKodesh, through divine inspiration. So let's listen to the words again of this hymn. Bar Yochai, ne'ezarta bigvura, you, the son of Yochai, Rabbi Shimon, are the Gilgul, you're the reincarnation of Shimon ben Yaakov, who was girded with strength in order to do battle against the immoral people of Shechem. You fought for the sanctity of Torah so that the flame of holiness can be upheld. You were willing to put your own life in danger by unsheathing your sword just to do battle with those who oppose our holiness. Just as it states in Sefer Bereshit, and Yaakov's two sons, Yaakov's two sons, Shimon and Levi, took Achei Dina, the brothers of Dina, each took his sword, and they came upon the city of Shechem with great confidence, and they slew every male. Bar Yochai, the son of Yochai, in the merit of what you did in a former life, that you wished to preserve the Kedusha, the holiness of this nation, you were Zaycha, you merited in your lifetime to reach high levels of spirituality and you uncovered the mysteries of Torah. All the secrets of Torah that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was able to discover were in the merit of Shimon ben Yaakov, who in the previous Gilgul fought in order to preserve our holiness. And it's that Kedusha that lived in Yosef so that when he was sold, as a result, he paved the way for us to be able to maintain our holiness as well. And now we could go back to the beginning of our shiur. The Sfarim HaKadoshim, the holy books, explain that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shamayim, he didn't only bring down the Torah. He also brought, brought down with him the Neshama, the soul of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? Well, what does Moshe Rabbeinu want with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's soul exactly? Well, let's remember that Pasuk that we said we're going to go back to. Alita Lamarom, Moshe, you ascended to the heavens. Shavita Shevi, and you redeemed a captive. The word Shevi, spelled Shin Bet Yud, is Rashetivot. It's an acronym for a name. Shimon Ben Yochai. Shimon, the son of Yochai. Rabbi Shimon wrote the Zohar Kadosh. We're taught that before Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came down to the world, that part of Torah, the mystical and most hidden sign of Torah, was concealed. Before he was born, this element of Torah Tanistar, of the secrets of Torah, wasn't yet known completely. So Rabbi Shimon, not only created revelations on the Torah, he uncovered an entire section of Torah that was unknown to us. 
So Moshe Rabbeinu turned to the angels, to the Malachim, and he said, I'm going to prove to you that what I've been saying all along is true and that the Torah belongs with us here on earth, not in the heavens. Because look what a human being is capable of doing in this world. And if the Torah stays with you in the heavens, we'll never have the Zohar Kadosh. We'll never discover the most elevated and divine revelations of Torah. Because look what Shimon ben Yochai is going to uncover for Bnei Israel, for the children of Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu was using Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai as proof of what the Rabbanim are able to produce in the study halls of Torah here on earth. And that's why the Malachim answered him, Ali Talamarom, you Moshe went up to the heavens to redeem the Torah from our hands. Shavita Shevi. And with the Torah that you brought down, you also redeemed the soul of Shevi, of Shimon ben Yochai, who will produce revelations in Torah that we cannot. And that will bring so much light to the world below and to Am Yisrael. Ashrecha Moshe, fortunate are you, Moshe. As a side note, the Holy Arizal, the Holy Ariya Kadosh, Alava Shalom, who was, was known for his incredible and lofty revelations on Rabbi Shimon's Zohar Kadosh, his name, the Arizal's name, was Yitzchak. Ben Shlomo, Yitzhak, the son of Shlomo. Very interestingly, the Rashetevot, the acronym of the word Shevi, Shin Bet Yud, backwards is Yitzhak Ben Shlomo. Ah, the rabbi responsible for the enlightening interpretations of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's words. His name was also hidden in the word Shevi. So notice how many chidushim, how many revelations one man, one person can expound on Torah. That's one of the reasons we're mourning during this time period of Sfirat HaOmer. Imagine if we had 24,000 rabbis like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, what our Torah would have looked like today. But when these students perished from this world, all those chidushim, all that hitchachut, all that revelation died along with them. So this time period isn't just about the rituals and the ceremonies. This isn't just another one of these et la asots. This is an opportunity for us to com contemplate the reason behind this time period and what we could do to be mechadesh ourselves to introspect, and to figure out how we could rise one more level up in our avodat Hashem, in our service to Hashem. Maybe this would be a good time when you donate for Torah hours to maybe donate in memory of these 24,000 Talmidim in the merit and in the memory of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in, in the memory of Yosef HaTzadik, all those who participate, all those who we just spoke about today, Shimon ben, Le, ben Yaakov, Levi ben Yaakov, that would be a great, great uh, thing that I'm thinking about now. It would be an incredible to donate Torah hours in, in their memory. Remember the words that we recite every day in the tefillah of Shacharit, in our morning prayers. What do we say? המחדש בטובו בכל יום תמיד מעשה בראשית. We're saying in these words that God is recreating the world every day. He recreates the world as long as we are recreating ourselves. Hashem is a מחדש. He recreates. But do you know what Chachamim say gives him the will to renew this world every day? When a Jew comes up with an innovative revelation on Torah, a chidush, when someone cares enough to examine the Torah and discovers its wonders, Hashem, he's not only filled with happiness, he's mechadesh the world, he recreates the world. So the Torah learning 
is keeping this world in existence. Hamechadesh betuvo, the tov, the good is the Torah that Hashem gave us. And with it, he enables us to extract its deep wells and reservoirs, a sea of revelations that keep this world in existence. So Lag Ba'omer, which is coming up very soon, the 33rd day of the Omer is a big day. Well, that's a day that everybody should be donating in memory of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in memory of Shimon Ben Yaakov, in memory of even Rabbi Meir Baal Anes. And after the Shi'ur, you can appreciate the grandeur of that day. Iratzon, that we should merit to uncover the Torah and understand the time periods in Judaism in a way that creates growth in us, in a way that rejuvenates us and renews us. And Be'ezrat Hashem, very soon, as a result of our willingness to be mechadesh ourselves, to renew ourselves through the Torah, we should merit the ultimate revelation of Mashiach, Bekarov, very, very soon. Amen, Ken. Amen. Amen.